Ladies and gentlemen, depending on the location you're calling in from, uh, Bonaventure Ahisiwe is my name. I'm the Regional Director for Strategy and Innovation at Seed Global Health, uh, Special Thanks to Afri Health uh, Secretariat for making this uh, webinar possible. And today we'll be talking about uh, repositioning uh, bedside teaching for the COVID uh, era. We are fortunate today to have uh, our panelists from Zambia, Malawi, and uh, Uganda uh, to share their experiences about different uh, aspects uh, that relate to that uh, topic. Uh, if you'll allow me, I'll give it, uh, we have about 250 people registered. I can see so far we have about 50 uh, online. So uh, I'll give it another two minutes uh, so that we can get a uh, reasonable quorum and we'll get uh, started. Uh, in the interim, I'll use this opportunity uh, to introduce um, our panelists uh, this afternoon or this evening. Um, Professor uh, Nelson uh, Sewan Kambo in many ways needs no introduction. Uh, he's a uh, principal emeritus for Makere University uh, College of Health Sciences. He's on the PI Council for the Afri Health uh, uh, Community. And uh, this morning he's going to be sharing us uh, with us reflections on repositioning uh, medical education from the context of building resilience of clinical training uh, programs. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Molinda uh, Nirenda uh, is an emergency, she's an emergency uh, medicine specialist uh, from uh, Malawi, uh, clinical faculty at Queens, uh, and also uh, does uh, didactic uh, teaching at the uh, university uh, in Malawi. Uh, Dr. Uh, Nirenda and Professor Nelson, uh, you're most uh, welcome to this uh, webinar. We'll also be joined by Professor Faston uh, Goma uh, from the, oh, Professor Faston Goma is actually on the line now. Uh, he's uh, currently leading uh, the academic team at Eden University. Uh, we've also interacted with him uh, extensively with the Afri Health community during his time as the Dean uh, of the Faculty of Medicine at uh, University of Zambia. So most welcome uh, our panelists and um, our, uh, we have uh, over 40 people right now and I think we should be uh, good to start. More will be joining us uh, in due course. So without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, uh, allow me to invite our uh, first panelist, uh, Professor Nelson uh, Sewan Campbell, who's going to talk to us about uh, uh, resilience of uh, reinforcing resilience of clinical training programs. Professor Sewan Campbell. Thank you very much, Chair. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> can you? Can you and participants? So as you've been informed, um, I'm going to be sharing with you some thoughts on reinforcing resilience of clinical training programs in the face of current and future pandemics. I thought I should start off with this slide so that just in case anybody goes to sleep, at least you will have seen one slide. This is the most important. And that is, uh, there should be, or oh, this is a moment to call for action, a call to action, because we have experienced fault line, or oh, fault lines have really uh, exposed. Um, issues in the bedside training of health workers. As shown in this photograph, yeah. major huh? fault for oh, Yes, how are you? Good, thank you, um, the focus, The focus of this uh, presentation is on face-to-face -face contact with the trainees 
uh, or by trainees, which poses a high risk to them and to all stakeholders. Because during training of, um, of uh, health professional students, it's not only the students who are uh, exposed to risk. There are several other categories of people, as we'll see later. I, I thought I should remind you right from the beginning is that in the bedside training or clinical training, we should not just be thinking about clinical, uh, but also having public health knowledge uh, that is essential. Because when you deal with a patient, you, it's not just a question of managing that patient, but considering public health aspects around the individual. And that in order to reinforce um, uh, our programs, we need to have complete comprehensive plans for the entire student pipeline. What do I mean by this? Uh, entire student pipeline, right from, let's say, the year one student until uh, the final year to graduation. Instead of just having a plan, <clears throat> let's say for the final year, but the entire pipeline. Also, we need to think about the education system that we want for tomorrow's health workforce, because the training that students are getting today uh, is not for today's service, but for tomorrow. And therefore, we need, as we think through this, to, to ask ourselves the questions, what kind of education system we want for our health workforce. To succeed in what we are trying or have started discussing, uh, we need to have a highly resilient system, health system, because the training takes place in a health system. And if the health system itself is not resilient, then we are unlikely to make a lot of success. So the action that we are looking for, we should be looking for, is to how to continue our university mission with minimum interruption during the pandemic or epidemics when they come. <clears throat> So the challenges that we face in first, uh, during first-to-first -first training, I'm sure we all know them, but let me go through them uh, briefly, some of them. Health and safety of our students is at the center of the consideration. Uh, but of course, faculty also, health and safety affects them, as well as other staff and the patients themselves as well as the patient's attendance. In our African environment, there are patient attendants usually who are within the training environment. How about leadership and management? For good implementation of the strategies that we may come up, good leadership and management is critical. Now, the, how about the quality of the academic programs that we implement? We need to pay great attention to that. But of course, in the background are the financial reality and other resource limitations in our environment. We need to consider those and put them in, contact, in context. As an epidemic or a pandemic rolls on, there's changing epidemiology and there's um, and other forms of knowledge. And there is a lot of learning that has to go on from day to day. New findings that we need to put into context. New policies, for example. New guidelines that come up. And then finally, <clears throat> uh, one challenge is that in all likelihood, in our environments, the students will play a dual role. And that is their trainees but also service providers. During the MEPI well-known Medical Education Partnership Initiative, 
one of the publications that came out is this one on the screen by Zongre Talib and others, entitled Medical Education in Decentralized Settings, How Medical Students Contribute to Healthcare in 10 Sub-Saharan Africa. And in those 10 countries, Uganda was one of them, Kenya, Ethiopia, Zambia, uh, Zimbabwe, uh, and so forth, South Africa. Uh, the students, it emerged from that study, which is in academic medicine, that, that students were seen as valuable resources for health facilities. They strengthened the health healthcare quality by supporting overburdened staff. They brought rigor and accountability into the work environment. And in those decentralized environments where uh, they were, decentralized clinical training could therefore transform health facilities into vibrant service and learning environment. Therefore, we cannot discount the fact that indeed students have a dual role. Then needs and tensions, and I highlight some here. During the pandemic or the epidemic, we needed to have authentic experience le learning of students during the pandemic or during natural disasters. The experience should be authentic. In fact, if they don't learn during that, those, uh, the pandemic or during the, the disaster, when are they going to learn firsthand what they should be learning? Uh, we shouldn't wait for them to graduate and wait for those uh, epidemics or disasters to begin discovering what they should uh, have known already. So shielding students from the realities of medicine in, in crisis times needs a lot of thought, whether it is the appro most appropriate thing to do or not. There is a need to contribute to service delivery during this catastrophe, as I've mentioned, uh, because the health workforce also, there is a shortage, they are stressed and they are overworked. As I mentioned, health and safety concerns are uh, an issue, uh, and students, just like health workers, may go, may go through stress, anxiety, and risk perception. How conducive are the health systems where these students are training from? And of course, we have to do research also during this pandemic, because it is the only way that we can uh, identify new findings that are brought on by this pandemic and therefore to do even better training. In Uganda, and I believe in many other countries, universities were completely closed on lockdown and they have just started reopening to final year students. There is a hidden curriculum that goes with closing down training. It sends, students may develop negative attitudes towards working in an epidemic or a pandemic, and therefore think that in the future they should keep away from these epidemic things or pandemics. There are also negative attitudes that may build up during the pandemic, negative towards the professions and beginning to say, these are the wrong professions. We joined the wrong professions. Uh, not only in, with the students who are with us already, but even those who are in the lower schools and were thinking about joining health profession. Failure to complete training is another issue. Uh, or even complete, uh, rather graduate, but without acquiring the required competences. Uh, then by students not being in training at this time, it contributes in the future to shortage of health workers. And finally, there is then a widening gap in access to quality services during a crisis and after that, 
between those countries that take positive steps to have resilient education compared to those which do not uh, institute resilient education. So what is the way forward? But what do the students say? I would like to share a paper which that was uh, published by Ugandan students in uh, JMIR Public Health and Surveillance, and it was in June this year. They carried out a cross-sectional survey in mid-April 2020. Um, so the, the publication is it's written June 9, <laughs> June 19, it's June 20, 2020. So they carried out an online cross-sectional survey and, uh, involving 2,500 students in nine institutions across Uganda. All those are health professions training institutions. Only one institution did not participate. It didn't uh, send represent, uh, have representatives. And the aim was to assess the knowledge, attitude, and practices of medical students Medical students here should be interpreted broadly as a professional student in Uganda during the pandemic. And I quote here about him the conclusion in their paper. Ugandan medical students have sufficient knowledge on COVID-19 and the majority are willing to join the frontline healthcare response when called upon. Medical students, especially those in the clinical years, may be harnessed to work alongside qualified healthcare professionals in the COVID response. Ronald Olu was the first author, and the entire paper is by students. When we consider developing a, a resilient educational system, I see a marriage between a health system resilience and education system resilience because the training takes place within the health system. We cannot have, as I said, a successful training without the, uh, the uh, a resilient health system. So general attributes of a resilient health system have been described. And the next step was for them to identify the capacities uh, that are required to have a resilient health system. Health system resilience has been previ previously defined as put here, the capacity of actors, institutions, and populations to prepare for and effectively respond to crisis, maintain core functions when a crisis hits, and informed by lessons learned during the crisis. Why should I be putting forward what the definition of health system resilience is. It is because I ask the question, what definition do we have for education system resilience, um, especially in terms of crisis? I looked for that and I couldn't find it. I take you back to a call to action. What does it take? Action to continue the university mission of service, education, and research. Research must be taken as an integral part of education, because as I said, that's where we generate new knowledge, we learn what is going on, and are therefore in a better position to perform uh, adequately and also give appropriate training. Call for innovation and creativity to have transformation education. As they say, COVID has really made things run much faster in different environments. Where people are sluggish to have innovation or where they thought a certain innovation could only be realized in a decade, things have happened in a few months. Therefore, this is an opportunity for us to really be innovative and creative and implement transformational education. A holistic, comprehensive plan for the entire pipeline, as I say, and what education system we would like to have. Let me reemphasize, a resilient education system 
must work glove in hand with a resilient health system. I think Afro Health and Partners can show leaders, leadership. They can show leadership. Examples that we learned from uh, Ebola, in the, the independent reviews of the global response during the West African Ebola epidemic stressed the value of establishing metrics to assess, monitor progress in improving countries' capacity to respond. I think we need metrics also for education system. In 2016, WHO created the International Health Regulations Joint External Evaluation Tool, the JEE, a framework and process designed to measure different countries' capacity to implement the requirements. I think we also need, we should think carefully about having a tool to measure or to monitor progress. So that's why I ask the question, how about resilience in education? Where, what is the thinking? We should be thinking in that direction. The next step, I think, is to define the concept of resilience in the education system for training health workers and what makes the system resilient. I'll stop there and leave the other two slides for a discussion uh, in the interest of time. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, uh, Professor Sewan Kambo, uh, more so for that powerful uh, call to action. Uh, I think this makes a very good <coughs> sideway into the next uh, presentation. Uh, Professor Sewan Kambo did flag the need to look at opportunities, uh, how uh, medical schools could actually be repivoted into resources in the face of the uh, epidemic. So this uh, leads us well into the next uh, presentation. Uh, admin, if you could help um, transfer the Professor Wanka lead us through the next uh, presentation. You're welcome, uh, <coughs> Professor Kagoma. Uh, very much. It's always uh, difficult to pick up from where Professor Sawan Sawan Kambo lives. You know, it's like he has said everything and you're wondering now, how do small people fit into such big shoes? But uh, it's always good to, uh, to have uh, people like him uh, tagging along with us. And I hope that uh, many more of our colleagues are looking up uh, to be mentored in this uh, environment. So thank you very much, Professor Sawan Kambo, for, uh, for, for that lead into this talk. I was uh, <clears throat> given uh, the topic uh, that is lo really looking at opportunities for integration of public health in clinical or bedside uh, training, really trying to reposition bedside teaching during this uh, COVID era. And I thought it's, 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 a, very, it's a very good uh, thing to do. We have always thought that you know, public health must be taught away from the bedside. And well, to a large extent, it's because of the way we define public health. I think in, to a large extent, we've always thought of public health as being equal to community health. And so it's something that is done in the communities and that is where it ends. You emphasize on prevention and health promotion and that's it. Once they come into the hospital setting, here we just talk curative. But I think the uh, COVID era has taught us to redefine public health or to define public health properly to, th to say that it is not the same as what we have been thinking. I've got here, I think what uh, may be a more comprehensive definition of public health in that uh, we take it <clears throat> to be the science and art of preventing disease, prolonging life and improving quality of life through organized efforts and in informed choices of society, organizations, communities, and individuals. I think that's a more comprehensive way of looking at uh, public health. Immediately, we look at it from that angle. We see that actually there's something that needs to be taught at the bedside. We need to actually get into a public health mode as we attend to the patients. 
Again, as Professor Sewan Kambo said, we actually lost an opportunity in most of the medical schools which closed during uh, the close down. And so the, the pandemic in places such as Zambia is almost over. And the medical students have not actually attended to a single COVID patient, so to say. And so they have really missed an opportunity to learn, to, uh, to learn something. When we consider uh, the issues of public health, we are really looking at looking not only at uh, the disease itself, but we are really looking at a way of, in which we can analyze determinants of health uh, of a population, and also to look at the threats that that uh, health of the population faces. That is really the basis of, of, of public health. And when we are talking of really uh, the public, it may be as small as a handful of people. It may be as large as a village or an entire city. And when it comes to a pandemic, it was really uh, entire continents that were uh, considered as public. And to some extent, our responses were seen, in my view, as being inappropriate sometimes. You know, uh, I remember the time, you know, when we heard of the outbreak, the outbreak was still out there. And yet, you know, people in the Zambian villages were already being told to start masking up. Masking up for what? <laughs> okay. But if that was all because we thought, well, the world is one global village. And so before you know it, it will be in some village somewhere in the eastern part of Zambia or in the western part of Zambia. But really, when we are uh, by the bedside, we are really looking at a patient holistically. And we need to look at not only the physical aspects of that patient, but also the psychological aspects and the social well-being of that patient and the community from which the patient hails. Immediately, we are saying public health ought to be a subject we need to teach at the bedside. Going further in trying to describe what public health is, we can also say that public health is the science of protecting and improving the health of people and their communities. And this is achieved by promoting healthy lifestyles, researching disease and injury prevention and detection, preventing and responding to infectious diseases. That I think is public health. And if you look at that definition again, you will see that is something that ought to be thought about when you are by the bedside. The aims of public health are really the aims that we have uh, of the entire realm of uh, medical, medical practice, so to say. In that, yes, we look at uh, prevention and treatment of disease, in the physical, but we also have to look at the mental health aspects. And I think COVID brought, on, brought in a lot more of, of that. And we do that mostly by not only uh, keeping an eye on uh, how the cases are going. This brings uh, to mind the issue of us, you know, having registries for almost all disease conditions. And I think this is something that we need to emphasize. <clears throat> in the uh, uh, African medical schools, that we ought to open registries for most of the conditions that we are seeing so that we can actually monitor. We can do an amount of surveillance from there and we can get an amount of uh, indicators from there, uh, especially those that uh, lead to uh, outcomes. And so by keeping registries, we should be able to say, how well are we doing? What are the factors that lead to better uh, uh, prognosis. What are the factors that lead to worse prognosis? And when we are looking at you know issues of mortality, again we should be able to easily tease them out, saying, well, these are the things that lead to uh, to mortality. And so we work on those issues to better our health uh, uh, outcomes. In public health, what is insisted on to a large extent is the issue of multidisciplinary teams, that we need to work as teams and not 
as uh, in, uh, individual uh, consultants, so to say. And so I think that's another uh, aspect that brings public health to the bedside. Uh, gone are the days when you know a consultant would be there, you know, uh, a consultant cardiologist is doing a round, and all the students around him, all they know, they are thinking about is the heart. You know, so you come to a, to a patient's bed. Yes, this is a case of uh, mitral stenosis. Yes, this is a case of uh, rheumatic heart disease. Yes, this is a case of atrial fibrillation, and that's all you see, cases. But I really think that, you know, as we are moving now in bettering our health care, we are thinking of persons, we are thinking of patients, and we are thinking of how well we can look after this person, physical and mental, and how he can fit back into the society, how he can get back to society and become productive in the shortest possible time. So we actually have to take a health systems approach. And it's very, very important that that must be looked at. And so when we are thinking uh, really of uh, bedside medicine in looking at conditions such as COVID, we cannot stop thinking public health. Because in public health, I've already said that, yes, we think of interdisciplinary uh, delivery uh, efforts, but also we need to have an interdisciplinary understanding. I think this is one disease that showed us that there's more uh, to, uh, to, specialize, to specialization in medicine than we may have to think. Because when you have a COVID patient, you have to think, yes, there are respiratory issues here, but the outcomes are more dependent on comorbidities. So you have to think of the comorbidities. How do you mitigate against the effects of the comorbidities? Then there's the whole issue of unknown therapies. Some still under trial, some, you know, are uh, being more ahead. And so you're thinking, how do we use what is before us? And so you always have to think together. You need an anesthetist on your team. You need, you know, a pulmonologist on your team. Yes, you may need a cardiologist. You may need uh, a diabetologist. You may need those are just doctors, but what about nurses? What about physiotherapists? Yes, you need physiotherapists to be by your side because you need them to look after their chest, to look after the ventilation and everything else that comes with COVID-19. Uh, with COVID And so, yes, when we come to COVID, we have to think more uh, of health systems. Again, we are in the realm of public health. Health systems, approaches have to take center stage. The primary one, obviously, has been the issue of human resources for health. And Prof. Sewankambu has said how important it is to have every hand around the table when you are looking at a health workforce uh, efficient utilization. And so really, we should not have sent away medical students at all. I think we needed them uh, to be there to beef up the uh, health workforce, which was available. We needed every nurse who was available to be available so that people work shorter shifts. I'm sure we saw that one of the uh, things that was leading to health workers getting infected was really long hours of working. They would lose concentration, but there was advice that the maximum period of time a health worker should do a, a shift in the emergency department or support before hours. So we should have changed the way we, we do uh, health workforce planning. Instead of people doing their usual six hour shifts, they should have been shortened. Four hour shifts, shorter, the better. Then you protect your people from uh, getting infected. And then there's the issue of commodities here, okay? We should have made sure that there are adequate supplies of PPEs, adequate supplies, you know, of other general supplies that are needed, meaning that the, the supply chain management was supposed to be at its best. And obviously we need to talk about health services themselves. In many hospitals, we had outpatient departments closing down. We had specialist clinics closing down and that really did not help in the training of our young ones at all. 
those clinics were required. They were very, very necessary at this point to make sure that we are keeping the cogs of the wheel uh, of, of the health system moving. When you talk about, you know, bedside teaching in times of emergencies, we have to say that, yes, when emergencies come upon us, they are opportunities for teaching. Yes, they are catastrophic events. Of course, we say we may end up getting infected. We know so many of our colleagues who died during the Ebola era. So many have died from COVID. But we must say that medicine is like uh, the military. You go to war to fight, but you know that in that fight, you may actually end up being victim. And so we come totally committed to us looking after our patients, but in the process, we may actually be victims. And all we do is to work to reduce the, the uh, possibility of us getting infected. And so we don't run away. We just learn how best to protect ourselves against getting uh, these infectious diseases. And really, we needed to have a holistic approach uh, in the care of uh, COVID patients, meaning that we, need, we needed to look at the entire continuum of care from the community to the clinic and back to the community. Meaning that, you know, when we are looking after these people in the hospital, we have to look at them holistically, so to say. I've talked about how we put, our, uh, we put together the care team, okay? That you need the nurses, you need the anesthetists, you need the physiotherapists, you need the biomedical scientists. We saw how much tests we needed to do here. We needed to do arterial blood gases. We needed to do uh, D-dimers. We needed to do all uh, those tests that when we needed biomedical scientists to be there. Then we needed these comorbidity specialists. Everyone was supposed to be part of the team. But much more, when we are thinking of discharging COVID patients, usually when we are discharging patients, we only think about their disease. Oh yeah, this is, <coughs> sorry. This patient came in with heart failure. He's going home now, give him this drug, give him that drug, give him that drug. Can we see him in clinic uh, in a week's time? Not so with the COVID patients. We have to think beyond. What community are they going back into? Are they still infective? Are they standing a chance of getting reinfected? Because I don't think we still have answers to immunity, okay? And so there's need for very careful discharge planning. And this is something that misses in the traditional uh, bedside teaching. Usually we end at the bedside. After we give them our prescription and review dates, that's it. We really don't think beyond. But in COVID, we have to think beyond now. To think about the community where they are going. How exact are they going to interact with the, that community? Is it going to be safer? And obviously, we had to think about contact tracing and follow up and isolation. All those, uh, all those issues are issues within uh, public health arena. And so what would we say then uh, are the particular uh, Morning. And uh, colleagues, there was some disturbance here, but we actually uh, had opportunity to think properly about how we relate to uh, issues of disease in terms of how we care for them in hospital and beyond the hospital. And I think it has opened up our arena saying that from now on, we don't continue teaching medicine the way we have always taught it. We need to actually put in more public health aspects. We have now come into the new normal and we need to live in the new normal. And this new normal calls for new methods of teaching, new methods of training, and new methods of uh, getting our young ones well geared for service in the health sector. Thank you very much for listening. I'm sure we'll say more in our discussion. Thank you very much, Chair. Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Goma Zikomo Kwambili, as you would say in uh, Zambia. Uh, and, Zikomo. Uh, yeah. Uh, the couple, I would like to encourage all the participants, please share your questions in the uh, chat. Uh, that will make it a lot easier to uh, cure them and answer them efficiently. 
since we may not have a ton of time towards the end. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Dr. Uh, Molinda Nyerenda, I noticed a number of people did join us uh, towards uh, uh, in midway when we had finished the introductions, uh, but she's a senior clinical lecturer and also clinical faculty at uh, Queens in uh, Malawi, as well as University of Malawi. Uh, Dr. Uh, Molinda Nyerenda, uh, it's always an honor. Please, you're welcome. Uh, sorry, Professor Nelson Sewan Campbell, there are some questions for you here. Uh, uh, first, a great um, appreciation from a number of people. Uh, I pick out one outstanding presentation from Prof. Joe Collars. Uh, the one question for you here is, where do you see opportunities for continuing to do bedside uh, teaching in low resource uh, settings at the surge of COVID-19 cases, given the need for critical care? and limited access to PPE. How could this be possible in resource limited settings? Uh, the other question, uh, okay, we have uh, Dr. Nirenda back. So maybe I'll pose the questions and uh, let her address us and then we'll uh, come back. Thank you, Dr. Nirenda, welcome back. Uh, audience that uh, I'm able to come back online. As we know in Africa, sometimes the network can have problems, but uh, hopefully we'll now be stable and be able to enjoy what we have um, for you today. And I know it's of interest for all of us as health workers, both training the upcoming um, um, health professionals, but also ourselves as well needed to have been in, engaged with clinical education during COVID as we adjusted to what was going on. So I have a disclaimer that uh, indeed, whatever I'm going to say is more about me than the institution. However, I'll share a few of the experiences that are related to what we did in Malawi. My outline is to basically highlight a few things that uh, the two profs haven't um, highlighted on mainly looking at the impact on clinical education, and then we'll discuss the safety measures based on learners, the faculty, patients, and then finalize with indeed, what can we take as take home messages um, and then open up the, the, the session, the or question and answer session. So without indeed um, overemphasizing what um, my previous speakers have discussed, I will focus on the electronic remote learning implementation because indeed as universities had closed, what was pertinent was the buzzword of electronic remote learning implementation to catch up with academic calendars. And also another aspect apart from just formal education was the aspect of reaching out health workers in various remote areas and how we could even uh, optimize remote um, learning uh, electronically so that we can indeed uh, roll out uh, health policies that were affected or that were pertaining to COVID uh, implementation. So these brought in the aspects of learning how to have virtual um, ward rounds or clinical spaces, which I don't think yet we have on the African continent, but indeed some people were using virtual spaces where they had a camera going around in a ward round and then sharing their experiences with uh, students or storing the videos so that indeed the students would engage with. Videos were a good way of indeed uh, recording ways in which people could learn clinical uh, skills, but also information in practice. Pertinent to this on the formal setting is that much as remote learning had been rolled out, there was always a need indeed as clinical educators that we need to have some face-to-face -face interaction with our, uh, with our students. And pertinent was that we needed to prepare the learning environment, which was quite interesting while we were navigating a number of things socially, um, as well as also the reduced patient volume, which resulted in minimum exposure to particular maybe common conditions that students may likely have to um, experience before they face uh, formal um, assessment. 
pertinent is that as an educator, as a, a learner, but also as a patient, psychosocial health issues have affected us all. And indeed the educators, we needed to handle this. And especially in, as an uh, education experience, both for the learner as well as the educator, we needed to handle these pertinent issues that probably were taken for granted when people are on a university campus and somebody else had to do it. But maybe as an educator, you needed to engage with them because you were actually been uh, working with them face to face. And we're talking about issues related to time management, issues related to where can I actually study? My home environment can't work. And it leads to financial issues. We know how hard hit people were. And this led to also problems because financial issues also segregated the electronic remote learning um, experience. How do you navigate for those who couldn't um, access in, um, internet, uh, internet with the amount of money they had? The other aspect is that clinical educators, both in the university and various places, were also incorporated within the national response, including trainees. So these are the things that I, we implemented from our experience here in Malawi, is that indeed safety measures for learners should indeed encompass the three aspects that we emphasize on that will result in a good learning experience. One is knowledge. So much as people were updating themselves on WhatsApp or internet, reading various, um, uh, various uh, papers, we needed to contextualize their experience with what they know about COVID-19 disease. And I'll mention this as we did for the students as they came, but also for our postgraduate trainees, as well as other, people, other health workers. With healthcare system adjustment, it was evident that not everyone would understand what was going on. So learners needed to understand what has changed, the door that I usually use to get to my clinical ward. How will I change my way of uh, entering the hospital needed to be discussed and infection prevention issues so that people understand why we are indeed uh, doing what we're doing. The other shooting policy that we want to emphasize on is when students returned or were engaging with formal training, we did discuss the issue of high risk and that we needed to, ask, uh, to the learner needed to understand their risk of getting COVID disease based on the risk factors. And if indeed they felt like the risk was high, they were given the opportunity to defer their studies to the next academic year without any penalty. Of importance is the attitude. And um, as clinic, as learners, sometimes we think we know everything or we can be able to find our various shortcuts. So familiarity needed to be reduced. I'll emphasize on the attitude for learners that we needed to bring up. And this is pertinent on the discussion of how universities closed. And then indeed, um, students were not able to learn the, ex the experience in pandemics. So specialties anchored in basic clinical practice. I would mention indeed that this was evident that we needed to optimize all the health workers to be involved. So in our setup, for instance, in, we had to include uh, postgraduate trainees who did not go home, but had to offer service. And we needed to include surgical residents within our, for instance, pool of trainees, who trainers who would indeed um, equip health workers. And that helped in modeling the fact that um, the COVID response will not just be for the emergency care providers or the medicine or infectious disease people, but in the surgeons who also be involved and should consider equipping themselves with knowledge. However, this is important to realize that when it came to rolling out in practice, this was not realized. So the surgical team uh, indeed did not um, participate frequently in terms of care on the uh, floor as it came to essential services only. So the practice is pertinent. As they are being, as they are being educated, they should have the infection prevention measures known. And this is important because they need to understand what is the risk, but how can we reduce it? Talking about being ready and equipped within disasters or real life situations. It is equipping people with knowledge and the practice that matters. Daily screening should be done for learners as they engage with the various areas where they're high risk. Currently our health facilities are high risk. 
And also we cascaded the clinical education exposure. So bringing in different groups of students to come in to the university, for instance, as we opened the various programs so that we could be able to adjust on logistics like accommodation where we would reduce, reduce overcrowding within the hostels. So on, in our environment, what we did was uh, we organized orientation sessions for our learners, all um, uh, uh, students who came back from uh, and were involved with clinical environments were, were under, went a four hour orientation session where we indeed discussed issues related to knowledge. Looking at the clinical environment changes, so we discussed what were the changes in the various health facilities, and then actually had demonstrations of hand washing, mask wearing, donning and doffing, which people really appreciated. Pertinent, based on some of the questions that were posted, was also to think of the cleaning and decontamination process, that indeed, much as we're equipping them within the, for the health facilities or the clinical environment, we also cared about how they would look after themselves when they came to the hostels, how they should manage themselves. Uh, a pertinent adjustment for the students was to say, we'll emphasize on wearing scrubs. You don't come with your no more clothes or have a particular type of shoe that you wear, hairstyles. Can you consider them? And then we discussed issues of um, recycling, how you can recycle masks, but also how you can decontaminate clothes that you've taken from the clinical area to your room and it, uh, indeed make sure that your room is safe. Waste management was pertinent. You know how, many, how much waste was, we've been uh, producing with all the PPE. So we discussed that so that indeed, not only is it about waste management, but also safety of the health workers and the students as well. So for the faculty, it was indeed preparation, but also ongoing process. Looking at the various measures that we've discussed, but pertinent as educators was to ensure that we are anchored to national health policies and not just what I think or what I have pulled from the internet that other people are doing, but also insisting that faculty also understand what are the adjustments in the hospital, especially when you have academicians who indeed provide clinical education, but may not necessarily be involved with clinical care. Shielding policy was important as well, that faculty should be safe to say, look, I'm a high risk person and I shouldn't be involved with clinical exposure and be able to probably concentrate on electronic remote learning and contribute in that way. The attitude again was pertinent and pertinent for the faculty is to be flexible and to understand that we can learn from our learners on how to use the innovations that have been coming up, mainly related to telemedicine as well as technology and also be flexible with the fact that we will have to have indeed what was discussed the multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary engagement to be safe as we deliver our student activity. So the practice was pertinent, lots of learning, technology um, using uh, platforms was pertinent, but pertinent was to be authentic and relevant. So what exactly are we teaching clinically that we can do remotely versus what we need to put in the face-to-face -face experiences? Another important aspect I'll emphasize on is communication modalities. I'll give an example of WhatsApp. We had an electronic platform that was working, but at some point, someone like me, who usually avoided talking to students on WhatsApp, learned that WhatsApp groups were easier to discuss with the students and communicate efficiently to students on what needs to be done. But also, they also used the WhatsApp modality to share experiences, which helped us also identify ways in which we would address issues, so embracing feedback and responding to it so that we were able to prepare packages that would help them become more comfortable as learners, not only at home, as they are waiting to come to the university, but also when they come, how much can we allay the fears that they had? So that was the experience. So alternate learning environments needed to be planned. And I'm giving an example of how outside door hallways are now good 
because once you're teaching the outside, you are sort of helping one another. But also indeed using mannequins, simulation modalities are best learned and easier. But the learning experience with very with real patients must never be compromised as asked within the chat room. We need to think of the physical distancing. So that's where preparation matters. Before we would create just one particular lesson plan and a teaching um, approach, this, this time we need to think of the logistics. So it's about the venue, capacity, how much can I do that? But also thinking of how you can cascade the various lessons. So this is an example of a particular article that provides ways in which you can think of how you can cascade the learning experience while reducing overcrowding in the clinical setup and seeing what you can do using simulation, what you can do as a clinical skill, for instance, and then what you can use as a tutorial. This is also another outline in which we actually used in adjusting our examination, so OSCE exams, clinical examinations. I'll give an example of our university what we did for the final MBBS is that we had those who could use uh, mannequins and non-patient related um, examinations. We had a particular day. And then after that, we had a certain day in which would increase the level of put, uh, personal protective wear and then indeed have patients and those clinical skills that required us to assess them using PPE were then um, rolled out. We also had to increase the, the uh, carousels for doing the clinical examination. So we needed more examiners. And that meant we needed to be interdisciplinary in our approach of how to indeed assess students. So this is very good for undergrads where we want to have basic skills um, translated and we want basic providers. For the patients, um, Pertinent is to always communicate the risk and they needed to know the risk that they had brought themselves to, even as they engage with uh, learning experiences. And we needed to communicate the measures of safety. But the attitude was important. And I think um, patients have been amazingly resilient and especially in the COVID area in our setup, you saw how patients were excited to be involved also with learning experiences as relayed on the fact that people appreciate the contribution of educators as well as learners. But pertinent was guardian control. And we're almost there. Guardian oh, yeah. control uh, that would help us indeed to reduce this crowding. So what are our lessons? As we've been discussing, COVID-19 has increased the awareness of us not becoming very specialized, but rather integrated as well as multidisciplinary. Pertinent as discussed as well about resilience is that best practice is best modeled in reality. So systematic examinations and, and um, of, uh, of uh, individuals, but also infection prevention measures that are adhered to in the clinical practice are very helpful. But indeed, embracing innovativeness and creativity, because indeed, amazingly, most of the students, as uh, the paper in Uganda has uh, relayed, were also able to show ways in how they can learn. So bedside teaching has not been replaced and will never be replaced, but we can learn safer ways in how we can improve how we do bedside teaching by being innovative and creative. I've got a few references, amazing papers that bring out the issues that I've raised, but I'm open for discussion indeed. And Ziko Mugwambili, Asante Sana, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, over to you, Bonaventure. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Molinda Nirenda. We're at the top of the hour, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we'll use an additional <coughs> 15 minutes for uh, discussion, question and answers. Uh, we totally understand for those who have to absolutely go at the top of the hour, uh, but we'll uh, take the next 15 minutes to do the uh, question and answer and discussion. So uh, back to our panelists, uh, Professor Nelson Sewan Campbell, there are a couple of questions that have come through uh, for you. And the first one was, uh, should we also be looking at political will and also into funding for education to scale this resilience to the next level? Uh, there was also a general comment for you about uh, your thoughts on how we could potentially continue 
teaching, given the need for critical care, uh, if there's a COVID-19 surge uh, in low resource settings. So I'll, I'll let you uh, take those and then uh, we'll go on to Dr. Gong, Professor Gong. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Let me take up the first question on political will. Um, my unreserved response is absolute yes. We must look for political will. And if we don't look for it, then we will not make, we are unlikely to make much progress. Let me use an example here in Uganda. During the COVID pandemic, Makere University has received um, money for research from Uganda government. The kind of situation that as far as in all the years I've stayed at Makere, I have never seen that. Government putting out money for research at Makere uh, in order that researchers can carry out research on COVID. More than 200 faculty have benefited from, from this funding. Similarly, education could have benefited if we were very proactive in seeking out political will. The second question on how do you ensure quality uh, given the low resources? We, I would summarize the answer by saying that this is one of the many issues where calls for our creativity in thinking and be innovative, asking those questions and then trying to find answers from our different environments. Um, one size may not fit all, uh, but at least there should be a concerted effort at a country level, national level, regional level to address these issues. If we were to do a survey across Africa, how many institutions have taken that issue seriously and discussed it? I'm curious as to what would come out of that uh, question. I'll leave it at that, Chair. Thank you, Professor Sewan Kambo. So, uh, Prof. Uh, Goma, there are a few questions for you. One, lots of people concur with you on the issue that uh, potentially students, uh, medical students shouldn't have been asked to go home. There's a question from, I think, Botswana, and it sounds like these were orders from above. University leadership simply ordered them to close, and university leadership was also taking orders from above. Uh, and the question is, do you know if there were people who handled it differently or in cases, uh, another round, uh, how could it be handled differently? And then there's another question, it's general, <clears throat> to all of you. Uh, it's about, uh, it's a concern and a question at this time, uh, at the same time, how do we ensure clinical competence uh, when we're using virtual platforms or if we're doing online learning? You could take on yeah. both <clears throat> Thank you, uh, thank you uh, very, very much, uh, Bonnie. Yeah, um, the the question of uh, the issue of close down. I think Professor Wankambo has addressed part of that. There was a lot of politics around uh, COVID, and so when uh, it's like uh, African Union says there must be, you know, schools must close. It's like every government was trying to be the at their best behavior. And so without consultations, everyone was just closing down schools. And I think when it came to Zambia, we tried to really get to, to get the basis for making that decision because our medical school is uh, small and was manageable. And we were saying, well, what is it that we are looking for? Are we looking for space? I think our students already have enough space. They're social distancing. Okay, are we looking for hand washing? I think we have enough facilities for hand washing and sanitizing. What exactly is the reason for them going home? And uh, we are told, well, it's from above. 
all schools must close, no exceptions. And so we all had to go home. Uh, but really, I think uh, Prof. Sewankambo has addressed that, that next time this happens, we must, uh, we must relate to uh, the, the political powers, that they may know the science behind every decision and the implications that that decision may have uh, for training and for uh, health workforce uh, resilience, uh, so to say. Uh, in terms of you know this uh, virtual virtual training, well, I think um, uh, Dr. Uh, Mulinda has uh, done a very very good job there. She has actually put it in, in into context that there's room for a virtual training, but bedside training cannot be substituted. There are those nuances that come from interacting with patients which cannot be simulated at all. And you may try your best, you never get it right. Until you get to talk to a real patient, that's when you understand that actually the patients are patients and it needs a particular skill to attend to them at, in a manner that uh, will make them satisfied and in a manner that will improve uh, their, uh, especially their psychological uh, health outcomes. Uh, so I'll leave uh, Dr. Melinda probably to uh, continue on that uh, discourse. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Nirenda, as you uh, plan to continue on that same uh, line, uh, there's also a question for you. Uh, someone from Nigeria said they really struggle to motivate learners uh, to, to come to the learning space uh, with limited PPE. And, and then there's also a question about, are there safer ways that you'd propose uh, to approach this? I wish it was an easy answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But that's why there are more than one head uh, speaking together and we talk about how we need to network with one another. So indeed, thank you. Uh, maybe I should address the PPE issue first and then we'll talk about virtual learning on the point that uh, Prof. Goma had left off. Personal protective wear was very rare and scarce in all our settings. I I'm not sure, but I think we're on the African continent and places, it was something we needed to mobilize and needed to be provided to health workers. And indeed, much as uh, health systems prioritized health workers as only the qualified, we could have mobilized also for students. So what did we do, for instance, when the universities were opening, it was pertinent that we did mobilize PPE for the students. Why are we saying this? It's something that naturally, even as health settings, we struggle in our setting to have enough PPE, uh, like gloves, for instance, just that basic gloves. So sometimes even the, the um, universities uh, um, do buy these things. So what we did was we optim um, the university optimized the amount of things they provide to the students. And indeed they streamlined to those students who needed to have clinical exposure. So not everyone, as long as you're on the University of Health Sciences should get it, but maybe those who required the face-to-face -face bedside teaching. And that has been done successfully. Reusable things, and that's why we said we also educated people on how they can reuse their PPE. So for instance, wearing the paper gowns, um, cloth gowns, rather than the commercial gowns, um, cloth masks where you should use them on the road, but in the hospital, you can use your face mask, but indeed use it and be able to recycle it. So PPE need to, needs to be provided to students and um, faculty. That is a no excuse. Everybody needs to get it. In terms of virtual learning, as you said, engagement with students and faculty was, is indeed challenging. It requires investment in um, a web space, but also time because learning experiences on virtual platforms are not just done you know, on ad hoc. You need to be intentional. We're not saying face-to-face -face sessions are not intentional. But there's a bit more you need to think about when you're doing virtual space learning to communicate what you have. So indeed, that skill is required. So we can embrace virtual space, but it needs to be safe. So for instance, the, the patient uh, uh, encounters can be suggested as bedsides and done in small groups. I'll give an example that in obstetrics and gynae, they assigned particular groups of people to particular firms. 
so that there were fewer students and they could go to that firm and they were accountable to that particular firm of uh, consultants and registrars. So you are then able to have that intimate space without even uh, crowding the patients. But also sharing of uh, patient experiences should be encouraged. So while you're doing a bedside experience of the same group, do a video of what is going on. Then indeed it's a real thing, not just um, some abstract people doing the, the video, but they can relate to their fellow student as well as faculty doing that video in real life and then they're able to view it as students later on. So indeed, um, having recorded things and then students being able to engage with them is important. But I must say time management is a big thing. So students need to be a, a given time to um, connect with the content. And you have particular also handouts that people can understand what are the um, outcomes and learning objectives with virtual platforms. Thank you. I must, uh, I must add that this paper is very good. Much as it is from a Western setting, it does give information that you can translate into local setups. And uh, I've shared the, the, um, the, um, the, the reference and I'll put it in the WhatsApp, uh, in the chat box. Thank you so for much. For the paper that I've emphasized on. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nirenda. I'll uh, invite our panelists to give their, would we'll take one minute and give their uh, closing remarks. I just end with two uh, very interesting quotes that came through the chat. I think one was from Botswana and it says, listening to all the panel, uh, panelists, if they had to give the best teacher award for 2020, it would go to COVID-19. Uh, the other one was, uh, the beauty of being caught off guard is that you, both your strengths and weaknesses are ruthlessly exposed. And this gives us an opportunity to build back better and stronger. So with that, I'll pass it on to our panelists. Uh, just use uh, half a minute to give any uh, closing remark. Uh, I'll start with you, Dr. Nirenda. Ladies, uh, being sensitive to gender. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I would say don't panic. Bedside teaching is still important. And regardless where we are, we are resilient enough to adjust to what we need to do. And allow students to give you ideas of how they can be reached out to. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Faston Goma. You can see I'm going in reverse order of the presentation. <laughs> I, I, I think that's, that's the best way to go. <clears throat> well, I think I would want to concur with my uh, friend from Botswana. Uh, COVID-19 has taught us a lot of lessons and we we'll do well to we'll utilize those lessons to build back better. And I really think that, you know, the way I think our discussion has gone gives us the ground that we can actually make a lot of progress. But really thinking beyond uh, the medical uh, model, we have to think public health and we have to think more public health within a clinical domain that we may relate well to our patients and to the communities from where they come from. And then disease prevention and control must be in the fore of our minds as we attend to the patients but, and as we teach our students by the bedside. Thank you very much. And I hope everyone uh, has uh, appreciated the session this afternoon. Thanks, Bonnie. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ziko Mokwambili. Uh, Professor Nelson Sewankambo, you'll have the honor to close this uh, webinar with the closing remark and we sign up. Let me say that students, 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 I always say this, we need to engage our students in making decisions. Uh, they come up with very good insights. Of course, some of their suggestions might be naive, but on the whole, they give some very valuable insights, and so we should engage them more and more on during challenging times. Uh, COVID, I think COVID should not leave our institutions. When the pandemic subsides or goes away, our institutions should not be the same the way they were when COVID started. Otherwise, 
institutions elsewhere, countries elsewhere will be, have moved so far ahead and we are years backwards. There's the issue where people keep telling you, but you know, training was done like this 30 years ago or 20 years ago, and therefore it, could, it should continue to be the same. My view is an absolute no. Not everything should be like it was 20 or 30 years ago. COVID has given us an opportunity to be innovative, to be creative, and have transformational education. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay. So they are uh, Professor Sewan Kambo, thank you all, our panelists and presenters, and a special thank you to the <coughs> Health Professionals Education and Research Subcommittee of uh, AfriHealth and the Secretariat for organizing this. Thank you so much. Uh, have a good day, good afternoon, good evening.